Hello and welcome to the Alliance for Democracies, the Populist Dialogues. Our program promotes progressive, populist perspectives on the issues of the day. The Alliance for Democracy is dedicated to establishing true democracy and creating a just society based on an equitable, sustainable economy. Our guest today is Daniel Lukau. Daniel is the ACLU Oregon's They Report to You campaign manager. So welcome to our program. Thanks for having me. All right, yeah, so they report to you. Mm -hmm. Who's, the, the, who's the, the they? The they are Oregon's 36 district attorneys. And each county in Oregon elects a district attorney, which is the top prosecutor uh, for every county. So Multnomah County has a district attorney, uh, Clackamas County is a district attorney, and uh, they have tremendous power in our criminal justice system. Okay. And because they're elected, our point of our campaign is bringing up the idea and bringing forward the idea that, that they ultimately report to the voters. Okay, which seems like it should be self-evident, but the, the problem, I think, at least part of the problem is that they very seldom get a challenger. Yeah, in Oregon, around 80% of district attorney races go unchallenged. And so DAs are all, the incumbents are often the only ones who appear on the ballot. Mm -hmm. uh, and as a result, most voters don't have options for how they want the criminal justice system to look. Mm -hmm. So uh, because there's so few contested races, uh, people pay more attention to legislative races or gubernatorial races or presidential races, and they often don't take a lot of time to examine district attorney races. And as a result, uh, more and more people are unaware of who DAs are, what they do, and what role they play in the criminal justice system. Right, yeah, which takes us right to the next question is, what do DAs do? Yeah, right. DAs are the top prosecutor in every county. So it's their uh, job to prosecute all uh, state crimes. So they're the ones who decide uh, who gets charged and what kind of uh, crimes they're charged with, what um, kind of sentences to recommend, uh, and whether or not to pursue something like the death penalty. Mm -hmm. They're also the ones who make decisions around whether or not someone has access to treatment or rehabilitation uh, or recovery programs or whether or not they have a, lo uh, a harsh, long prison sentence. Okay. And so DAs have a lot of power over people's lives. And the moment the handcuffs are put on you, uh, you're really in the DA's hands. Okay, and, and, and the DA's, being in the DA's hands, what consequences can that have? Yeah, well, so 95% of uh, criminal charges are resolved through sentences. Very rarely do, do um, uh, convictions go to trial, or uh, sorry, very rarely do charges go to trial. So most of the time uh, when people are arrested and charged with a crime, it ends up with them sitting across the table from the, from the county's district attorney and negotiating about what their future is going to look like. So the DA can sometimes use that power in the plea negotiation deal to uh, try to send someone to prison for a long time. Mm -hmm. And uh, we believe that district attorneys who are, of course, elected should be accountable for their charging decisions and their conduct of their office. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, and, and so specifically, American Civil Liberties Union, why, has, why have they uh, taken up this uh, campaign? We are an organization that cares very deeply about criminal justice reform. We think our criminal justice system is very unbalanced at the moment. Uh, right now, uh, he, when people are charged with a crime, and especially if they're sentenced to prison, they often end up, once they're released from prison, um, being cycled throughout the system again and again. And, you know, when people are released from prison, uh, or even if they don't go to prison but they go through the criminal justice system, it's harder for them to find jobs afterwards, it's harder for them to find housing, and it's harder for them to reintegrate into society. And so they, they end up going through the revolving door of the criminal justice system and being put back in prison um, or, you know, or through other programs mm -hmm. that we think make the community less safe. And uh, 
I think it, it, I think it's more focused on punishment than on treatment for people who are going through difficult times. Okay, and, and so if you had more candidates running for DA, you think that would make a difference? I think it's always always good when voters have a choice and when they have a community discussion mm -hmm. about how they want their criminal justice system to look like. The district attorneys have so much power over people's lives when they arrest them, but they also have power about how the criminal justice system operates. And they are the ones who ultimately decide whether or not we prosecute the war on drugs or whether or not we uh, keep mandatory minimums. Uh, and so I think district attorneys have this power to hold the criminal justice system back, but they also have the power to reform it. And if voters had options at the ballot, and if they had lots of uh, different candidates running, presenting different perspectives and viewpoints, uh, it would allow voters to really engage in a community conversation about how they want their own criminal justice system to look. Mm -hmm. uh, the ACLU of Oregon does not endorse or oppose candidates for office and we don't have a PAC, we, we're not involved in promoting candidates. But we do believe that voters uh, should be able to have uh, options going forward in terms of what they want their criminal justice system to look like. And we also think democracy is only healthy when there's um, different viewpoints being brought forward. Mm -hmm. and, and you really only bring different viewpoints forward if you have more than one candidate for a particular office. Right. Right, right now our democracy is a little stagnant when it comes to district attorney elections. And as we said before, around 80% of them are uncontested. Uh, around 23% of Oregonians cannot name their current district attorney. Uh, you know, when we talked about legislators and governors and mayors, we have an understanding that they are usually available to the public. So the whole coffee, you know, uh, coffees in our community or the whole town halls or forums or debates, mm -hmm. That does not really exist for district attorneys, and the public often does not have access to their own DAs and the ability to reach out with them and share their own viewpoints. Mm -hmm. And we think that DAs need to spend more time engaging with the public and listening to the to voters' concerns and where the voters want their system to look like. Okay, yeah. And I was just testing my memory yeah. to see if I could remember it. Underhill? Underhill, uh, yeah. Is the uh, Rod Underhill is a district attorney for Multnomah County. Okay, and he's relatively new to that job. I believe he's pretty new, and I want to be really clear that district attorneys are not, they're not all villains. I think mm -hmm. DAs do a lot of good with the power they have. Uh, district attorney Rod Underhill is uh, supportive of bringing a program here based on uh, the lead program out of King County, which allows for diversion uh, for people who are in the criminal justice system. So instead of sending them to prison, there are other ways to hold them accountable and still keep them connected to the community. Mm -hmm. The district attorney of Deschutes County, John Hummel, uh, recently stood up and supported uh, a, a really crucial transparency bill in the legislative session, even though other DAs were against it. So. Sometimes DAs use their power to hold the system back, but a lot of times in Oregon they use their power to move the system forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it seems like, you know, irrespective of whether they're trying to hold it back or move it forward, those are discussions that should happen during an election, so we all have some influence on it. And between elections too, mm -hmm. voters should be able to reach out to their district attorneys and know that they can have conversations with them about how to make the system better. So in Oregon, as in the rest of the country, we know that if we want to change our educational system, we can have conversations with our school board members. Mm -hmm. We uh, know that if we want to change our taxation system, we can have conversations with our legislators. And the They Report to You campaign believes that voters should know that if they, have, if they want to change their criminal justice system, they can have conversations with their elected district attorneys. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. Hey, and so um, you launched this program, this campaign, about how long ago? Uh, it was launched on August 27th, 2017. Okay, so the DAs have had a chance to respond? It's been a range. Um, the DAs have uh, responded in a myriad of ways. Some district attorneys, including uh, Multnomah County District Attorney Rod Underhill, have 
uh, made supportive statements and they've said things along the lines of they support the educational values of the campaign and they think it's important that people are educated around how their democracy works, mm -hmm. uh, especially when it comes to district attorney elections. Other district attorneys, like Clackamas County District Attorney John Foote, have condemned part of the campaign and have made accusations around the ACLU which aren't true and aren't backed up by facts as a way of delegitimizing our campaign. Mm -hmm. And so it's a range of approaches and a range of responses. Uh, and we just want to be really clear that we are running a grassroots educational campaign to give voters the tools to evaluate how the district attorneys are performing and whether or not we could and, and how we could strengthen our criminal justice system. There's nothing controversial about that. Mm -hmm. Okay. It, it, this, this whole thing seems to dovetail with this, this uh, more general uh, campaign efforts to uh, not put so many people in jail and not keep them there so long. You know, in the mid-1990s, we had around 6,000 people incarcerated in Oregon, and now we have around 14,000 incarcerated oh. in Oregon. The cost for putting people in prison and maintaining our prisons has exploded. And as a result, we're using less taxpayer money to fund schools and healthcare and jobs programs, which actually are proven to reduce crime. And we're instead diverting more and more of that money to maintaining prisons, which aren't the most effective way of reducing crime. Mm -hmm. And so our prison population has exploded, the cost of maintaining our prisons has exploded, and district attorneys can really use their power to reverse that trend and send fewer people to jail. Okay. Do uh, district attorneys have some kind of incentive for sending people to jail? I think that there's a cultural incentive. In the 80s and 90s, America became really focused on tough on crime, mm -hmm. and uh, voters wanted their district attorneys and their judges and their other elected officials to be really tough on crime. And so, to this day, DAs still largely run on tough on crime um, messaging. However, what I think is really important to point out is that voters have changed their mind on this topic. Mm -hmm. And we've done polling that shows that the vast majority of voters believe that uh, district attorneys and the criminal justice system at large should focus more on treatment and rehabilitation and prevention instead of on harsh prison sentences that the vast majority of voters, Republicans, Independents, and Democrats, believe that the war on drugs is not working and we need to change strategies. And the vast majority of voters think that uh, people who go through the criminal justice system should have a second chance and should be able to uh, reintegrate into society. And so voters have largely changed their minds and want to move away from tough on crime but a lot of district attorneys are not hearing that message, and the They Report to You campaign has looked at changing that dynamic so that DAs interact more with their voters and understand that voters want a different approach. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so currently, there really isn't any way for me to go have a conversation with a DA. It's very difficult to do. Uh, the They Report- Yeah, because uh, you know, it's kind of like, I I'm sorry to interrupt yeah. you, it's like, I know I can go to, talk to my legislator, yeah. I could go talk to the mayor or the commissioners, but it never occurred to me to think about going and talking to the DA. Yeah, I, I say that's true. Most people don't know who their DAs are or how to get in touch with them. And again, um, there's not really a culture in Oregon of DAs holding community town halls and forums to engage with the public. Mm -hmm. The They Report to You campaign wants to change that. So we set up our website, theyreportto.org where people can go and they can actually email their district attorneys through the website and reach out to them and uh, provide their input for the way the system could work better. Uh, we want to eventually hold town halls and public forums uh, all throughout the state so that uh, everyday voters can come and engage with their district attorneys. And we hope DAs uh, take a page from that book and and you know, hold their own forms and offer voters uh, proactive ways to engage with them. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what, what, what stops, well first of all, what are the qualifications for being a DA? The only qualification is that 
you need to be an attorney. Okay. Uh, and I think other than that, uh, you don't even have to be a criminal justice attorney. Uh, you just have to be a registered attorney. But other, or I'm sorry, a licensed attorney. But other than that, uh, it's a relatively uh, open thing to run for. And in fact, if you get elected, district attorneys don't even have any kind of court training they have to go through in Oregon. Public defenders, public defense attorneys do have a training that they have to go through. I believe sheriffs have trainings that they have to go mm -hmm. through. But district attorneys, with the tremendous power they have over people's lives, don't have any kind of court training that they have to go mm -hmm. uh, undergo to, to do their jobs effectively. And we think that's something that needs to change. Mm -hmm. okay. right. Voters still want to have DAs that are tough on crime? I'm sure there are some voters out there, but the vast majority of people have really changed their mind on this. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, we have, it's been 25 years since Measure 11 passed that imposed mandatory minimum sentences in Oregon. And that's a quarter of a century. And so uh, voters have really changed their mind uh, and moved away from that. And you know, they've seen that we've had 25 years to try tough on crime approaches. I, I, and, I mean, to try minimum, mandatory minimums. And we've had longer than 25 years to try tough on crime approaches. And it really hasn't made our community safer and it isn't the most proven, effective, humane way to tackle criminal justice. Mm -hmm. So uh, voters have seen, based on the evidence, that tough on crime isn't really working for Oregon. And also, we are now in the middle of an opioid crisis. So uh, people reckon, and it's unfortunately um, touching families and individuals all over our state. And I think everyday people recognize that people who suffer from substance, from substance addiction uh, aren't criminals. They're our family members, they're our friends, they're our colleagues. Uh, they're people we know who are right now addicted to a substance. And the best way to help them through that process is to help ensure that they have access to treatment programs and that they have access to recovery and not that they're thrown in a cage. Okay. And right. so I think that really helped lead to voters changing their mind about uh, why tough on crime isn't the right approach. Okay, so, but with Measure 11 they're setting minimum, minimum sentences, how does that give the DA flexibility to, to, uh, to do other sentences? DAs don't have to sentence people under mandatory minimums. Hmm. It's their option to do it, it's their discretion. That's the kind of power they have in our system is that they can choose which charges to bring against an individual. And oftentimes, just kind of in the weeds of it, in the plea negotiation process, uh, district attorneys will do something called charge stacking which they'll take a bunch of charges and they'll put them all on top of each other and they'll go to you and say, it's your right to go to trial, but if you do go to trial, I'm gonna charge you with these nine different crimes, for instance. Oh. Mm -hmm. However, if you, and you know, maybe five of them will be mandatory minimums, but if you agree right now in the plea negotiation not to go to trial and waive your right to trial, then I'll only charge you with like two crimes. Oh. And so you'll go to prison for a last time. I think that's really problematic though, because if you're an individual who's in the system <laughs> and maybe you're, you're, maybe you're a young person and you don't have a lot of experience with the criminal justice system, maybe you don't have a lot of money and you can't hire uh, a, a private attorney, uh, or maybe English isn't your first language and you um, sometimes struggle with uh, some of the elements that the DA is bringing forward, just linguistically. Um, if, you're in that, if you're in that place when you're across the table from a district attorney, you're in a really vulnerable place. Mm -hmm. And the DA says, I'm gonna you know, either go to trial and get you in jail or prison for like 15 years or 17 years, or right now if you accept the deal, you only have to go for like three or four years. A lot of people accept that deal even though it's still not right and it's still not just. Right. And so the answer to your question is that district attorneys get to often choose which mandatory minimums to, or if they want to bring a mandatory minimum <laughs> charge against a, a person in the system, but they also use mandatory minimums 
and hold them over people's heads during the plea negotiation process. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. Uh, so it really do, I mean, they, they really are much more uh, powerful than I had even thought. They're really powerful, yeah. and they're. Uh, I would argue that they're more powerful than police officers, and they're more powerful than judges because only five percent of the time are charges actually sent to trial, where a judge is present. Most of the time, they're not. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Uh, so, so how, how many? How many? Or what? What percentage of the cases that DAs are involved with actually do go to trial? Ninety-five percent of cases are resolved through plea negotiation. Oh, yeah. Only 5% are resolved through trial. So mm -hmm. only 5% of the time are, does a defendant have access to a jury and a judge to counteract the DA's power. Okay. A lot of times they don't. Yeah, so, so that would really stress the system mm -hmm. if they all went to trial. It would place stresses on the system, but our current system isn't working, at, it isn't working as best as it could. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I think the fact that a lot of people are in situations where they're negotiating over their very future uh, and they have a mandatory minimum hanging over their head, that's not a fair, that, that's not really what justice looks like to us. And that's not, that, that's not a fair system. Yeah. Okay. Very good. So uh, as the campaign goes on, how are you going to be engaging with, with, with voters? Yeah. We started out by knocking over 15,000 doors in Marion and Washington County and talking to people and engaging with them about what they want the system to look like. And the vast majority of people prefer treatment and prevention over harsh criminal sentences. Uh, so that's what we did over the summer. What we're doing going forward is we're going to be engaging with people throughout the community. We're going to be uh, connecting individuals to their own district attorneys or to lawmakers, either through our website, theyreportto.org, or through um, events that we'll be holding and we'll be organizing forums and town halls in different communities across the state for people to engage with the criminal justice system to think about this a little bit more deeply and uh, bring their viewpoints to the district attorneys. Okay. Yeah. Is, is this kind of campaign going on in other states? A couple other states have started it. I believe uh, the ACLU of Northern California because there are three ACLU chapters in California. Okay. The ACLU of Northern California has launched a campaign like this and I think there are a couple other states that will be starting one soon. But we're really at the front of the pack, and Oregon's a leader in this, uh, in, in this effort to educate and empower people around district attorneys. And I think a lot of other states are going to follow our lead. Okay, all right. And then how can people who feel like this is an important issue, how, how can they get involved with it? They can definitely visit theyreporttoyou.org. And you can, there's a bevy of information there where you can find out who your DEs are, what they do, how they interact with the system. You can contact your district attorneys, or you can also contact the governor or other, or other influential folks through, this, through the website. Uh, and you can sign up to be involved, too, and learn about events that we have coming down the pipeline. Okay. So they report to you as a .org is the best way for people to engage. Okay, all right, good. And uh, we've got four more minutes actually probably a couple more minutes so do you have a final statement to to our to our audience yeah i think the big thing we want to point out is that uh you know our criminal justice system does not have to look the way it does uh we can we can change it and if we organize and bring our views forward and talk to our da's and say hey we want this system to look different the system will change so if we want to end the war on drugs, we can do this. If we want to uh, stop sentencing people to long prison sentences, we can do this. If we want to have more oversight of the system, we can do this. It's not, we don't have to wait for the legislature or the Congress to act. We can bring this to our own district attorneys too. Mm -hmm. And I think the other thing to point out is that it really does fall on us. District attorneys don't, uh, they have a tremendous amount of power in our system, and they, I would argue they have more power over an individual's life than any other elected official does, but they don't have a lot of oversight or accountability. They don't report to the Oregon State Bar. Uh, they don't really report to judges. Um, and while the legislature does fund their offices, they don't really report on the day-to-day -day conduct to the legislature. 
So DEs have a tremendous amount of power over people's lives, but not a lot of accountability for how they use their power. There's not a lot of oversight. And so it's our job as voters to lean in and say, hey, we are your constituents, uh, and we want to make sure the system makes sense, is fair, effective, and accountable, and that it uses our money wisely. And so we want district attorneys to answer to us as constituents and as voters. And if we do that, we can make our criminal justice system uh, much more effective and much more humane than it is right now. Great. Thank you very much for being here, Daniel. Thanks so much. I really appreciate it. Good. Good. Thank you. We've been talking with Daniel Lukell, campaign manager with ACLU Oregon for their their, They Report to You campaign for district attorney reform. Do you agree that corporations are not people and that money is not speech? Then Alliance for Democracy is sponsoring the event for you on Thursday, December 7th, 7 p.m. at the First Unitarian Church here in Portland, Oregon. Caitlin Saposi Belknap, National Director of Move to Men, will address us in a forum on creating real democracy by ending corporate rule. Move to Amend is a national campaign to abolish uh, corporate constitutional rights and eliminate big money from elections. She will report on and discuss actions that have been taken uh, in hundreds of communities across the nation in support of the federal We the People Amendment, HJR 48, as part of a larger movement of needed fundamental democratic changes. So that is Thursday, December 7th at the First Unitarian Church at Southwest 12th and Salmon here in Portland, Oregon. Doors open at 6.30. Event starts at 7 p.m. Have you missed one of our programs? Want to watch something again or suggest a friend watch? Well, you can do that as all of our Populist Dialogue programs are saved to our webpage. Visit www.populistdialogues.org to view past programs or when viewing a program, to sign up for our YouTube Populist Dialogues channel to receive notification when a new program is added. Thank you for watching. We'll see you again next week. Bye.